Jesus. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Layton, and thank you for joining me in our journey to hope. It is my desire through this podcast to bring you information about how to discover, sustain, or perhaps regain hope. In this episode, we're going to look at a person from the Bible who made a mistake in her life and was outcast by society. But not only outcast, she was marked for death. Yet from her seemingly hopeless situation, she finds forgiveness, compassion, love, and hope through Jesus. We'll also see how this woman's plight applies to us in our life. As John begins the eighth chapter of his gospel, the Gospel of John, he tells of an event known as the woman caught in adultery. I like to call it the woman forgiven for adultery, because that's the emphasis that Jesus placed. You know, words often elicit strong emotions. Well, adultery is a word that causes revulsion as it shows unfaithfulness, a betrayal of trust between a husband and wife. It is such a harsh sin that it is one that God allows as an acceptable reason for a marriage to be dissolved. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, and also in Matthew 19, 9. And in the period of this woman's life, it can even lead to the death penalty. Oh, they had Jesus this time for certain. They had the physical evidence and the law clearly behind them. Surely this would bring an end to this charlatan's tricks. There was no way he could get out of this trap. Well, those were possibly some of the thoughts of the scribes and Pharisees as they drugged the hapless woman to Jesus. Caught in the act of adultery, a sin that condemned one to death. You can read about that in Leviticus 20, chapter 10. They now could play the crowd in the government against Jesus. As morning breaks following a night on the Mount of Olives, Jesus is teaching a large crowd in the temple when suddenly there's a commotion. One can see the crowd parting as the scribes and Pharisees drag a disheveled and bewildered woman to him, then pushing her ungraciously before him. They make their accusations that she has been caught in the very act of adultery. They demand a decision from him on whether they should stone her to death for her grievous violation of the Mosaic law. They only had a pretense of desire for justice. Their real motive was to trap Jesus into a no-win situation where either they could accuse him of violating Mosaical law or Roman civil law. It's often pointed out that the man involved in this adultery is missing. Yes, by law, he should have been there as well. But the pitiful and hopeless figure, and in most need of hope, is the woman. Jesus knew their true motives, so he simply bends down and begins to write in the dirt with his finger. They continue to ask him what he directed. Jesus then stands up and states that the one without sin to throw the first stone. Then he bends down again to write in the dirt. You can imagine the hush that fell over the crowd. Then, beginning with the oldest accusers, they begin to shamefully drop their stones picked up in self-righteousness. Like the stones that they dropped, they could only drop their accusations and slink away in defeat. As the last one leaves, Jesus turns to the woman standing alone, helpless before him, clutching her ragged clothing around her, and she attempts to regain a measure of dignity. He asks her where they are that had condemned her. She replies that there are none. Then Jesus kindly and mercifully replies, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Wow, what a scene this was. Yet perhaps this event shows us more about the character of Jesus and how he offers hope more than any other. And he takes a life ruined and renews it. 
A woman made a remarkable journey from hopeless to hopeful. As we've stated in several of our episodes, we see that there's hope sparked, hope sensed, and then hope seen. As, the, as seen in this event, as the woman was thrown before our Lord, clearly guilty of her crime, she has no hope. Yet she hears an unexpected statement from her judge, our Lord. She hears him turn the accusation to those that brought her and those hungering for blood. Then she hears the stones fall to the ground instead of feeling the pain they would bring about her death. And then we see hope sensed. Our Lord then turns his focus to her. But instead of hearing further condemnation, she hears a quiet question that forms the foundation of emerging hope. Jesus asks her where her accusers are. Perhaps the former hapless and hopeless woman now begins to realize that she is alone before the judge without the evidence of collaborating accusers. Now, hope seen. There she stands alone before the judge, and our Lord upholds the law by stating that he does not nor could not accuse her. Under Mosaical law, there must be more than one witness before a crime can be accused. Therefore, there is no other recourse than to remove the charges completely and set her free. That is certainly an offering of hope. But that is not the hope she grasped most of all. Your Lord forgave her. He acknowledged her sin, but removed it in that moment. And not many days later, he removed it on the cross. As remarkable as this event was for the time that this woman lived, we can look at it and apply some principles from it to our lives. First of all, we see that our Lord came to forgive, not to condemn. Jesus states this, among other places, in John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We can put ourselves in the place of the woman in this event. We are clearly guilty, and there is a clear sentence to be carried out. We have no hope or expectation of anything but punishment. That is not an extreme thought. Each of us has sinned and deserve punishment. You can read that in Romans 3.23, where Paul says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there's so much more to this passage from Romans that Paul points out to us that shows the grace and mercy of our Lord. Paul teaches us that we are declared free from sin. This grace is a gift given by Jesus through his sacrificial death. It is an offering that is an acceptable compensation by God. In granting us grace, God shows his divine nature of love and forgiveness. We receive this grace through our obedient faith. Now, please note, we're not earning salvation. We are receiving it in faith. The second thing we learn is our Lord takes the first step. The woman in this event did nothing to express her faith in our Lord. This, too, demonstrates the amazing grace of our Lord. He did not demand her faith, knowing she likely was unable at that moment to express it. Rather, he planted the seed for her redemption by his mercy. Certainly, the woman in this event wanted mercy. She did not want justice, for that would have led to her death. He dared not hope for grace. We know the statement in John 3.16. In, in his conversation with the scholar Nicodemus, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But continue reading to verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. God, in his infinite love, knows we are helpless before him, deserving punishment, and unable to find forgiveness on our own. 
God made a provision and offered it to us through himself by sending our Lord to show us the way and to become the way. Later, Paul teaches us that our Lord did this even as we were rebellious to God as undeserving sinners, not even seeking forgiveness. God knows our need and our inability to even imagine how to meet it. So he comes to us offering what we need. A third lesson we can learn is that Jesus offers a greater law. The Mosaical law for this sin is clear. Both parties in the sin are to be stoned to death. Yet the law also offers mercy. You probably know the story of David and his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and then later the murder of her husband Uriah. You can read that in the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 11 and 12. Well, as David stood with his treachery exposed before God, he acknowledged his guilt and pleads for forgiveness. God, faithful to his promise and ever willing to be mercy and acknowledge humble repentance, restored David. Later, As David wrote in his great psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, in verses 16 and 17, he states, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. All through the days of the Mosaical Law, God accepted the offerings of various sacrifices to enable his people to be given freedom from their sin. As we know, these multitude of sacrifices, especially the blood sacrifices, pointed to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Now we have our Lord coming to offer us a greater law, a law of liberty. That's found in James chapter 1, verse 25. This law of liberty frees us from sin. He stated as he began his ministry that his purpose was not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Our Lord then gives us his great Sermon on the Mount to show how God's way is superior to the misguided and misunderstood ways of man. Six times in the Sermon on the Mount, he stated that in some form that they had heard it said and then he would talk about a certain point of the law that they had misunderstood. But then he says regarding the misunderstanding or misinterpretation of God's will, he then says, you've heard it said, but I say. But more importantly, Jesus demonstrated his teachings throughout his ministry before large crowds and to individuals such as the woman in this event. Our Lord taught love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And through all of that, he gives us hope. And all of these are demonstrated in this singular event. And at the core of all of it is the hope that he offered. We do not know what Jesus wrote in the dirt, but we know what he wrote on her hand. He wrote hope granted by his forgiveness. One can imagine that this now forgiven woman could be one of those lining the way as our Lord was led to the cross. Perhaps she was among those who quickly embraced our Lord as the community of believers began to swell after the day of Pentecost. I imagine later, as perhaps she sat alone in her home, she would have felt the awe for the one who fully understood her need and showed her love, grace, and mercy, and granted her hope. All of us one day will stand in the presence of our Lord, accused by Satan. But if we have been obedient and are faithful to his will, Jesus will have removed our sin like this sad and wretched woman. And like the woman, our accuser will have fled, leaving us to hear, Neither do I condemn you. Oh. What a Savior we serve, and he invites you to turn to him and claim the promise of a new life full of hope. Friends, 
Thank you for joining me in this podcast as together we journey to hope. I invite you to continue with us as we gain insights into not only our journey to hope, but how we can help others in their journey. I invite you to contact me if you have questions or comments or you wish to share with me something you've experienced in your journey to hope. My email is ourjourneytohope at gmail.com. That's our journey and the number two hope at gmail.com. I look forward to sharing more with you soon. Again, thank you for listening. And until our next episode, remember, we give all glory to God the Father.